Good morning. I am delighted to welcome you to UMBC. We're delighted that our Secretary of Education is here. Um, we are in a very special period in the evolution of our country uh, in so many ways. We're delighted that you're here today to listen to some of the leading presidents in the country um, who will talk after the Secretary. You're in the Arts and Humanities Building, and we especially wanted you here because people think of us for STEM, but we think this is a time when we need to be preparing students to be broad thinkers as we analyze where we are as a country, as we think about the gaps in our society. No time in our country has higher education been more important than right now. We in this room understand that education and higher education will make the difference in closing those gaps. Uh, and so we've got uh, leaders here, educators here, elected officials here and others. Um, I am delighted to introduce the last year's president of the student government, uh, who has been a wonderful leader with our students in shared governance and in making hard decisions this past year. And so Ganesh, would you please come up? Ganesh Mysore is a uh, senior this year, majoring in both chemical engineering and political science. So he's got a broad, broad thinking. Give him a round of applause. Thank you, sir. It's now my pleasure to introduce the United States Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan. He has served as Secretary since January 2009, following his nomination by President Barack Obama. And his tenure has been marked by a number of significant accomplishments on behalf of American students and educators. He helped to secure congressional support for President Obama's investments in education, including $100 billion in the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act to fund teaching jobs the elimination of student loan subsidies to banks, and reform efforts such as race to the top and investing in education. In support of President Obama's goal for the United States to produce the highest number of college graduates by the year 2020, Secretary Duncan has helped uh, secure increases in the Pell Grant program to boost the number of young Americans attending college and receiving loans and receiving degrees. He also oversaw the introduction of the income-based repayment program, which reduces student loan uh, payments for college graduates in low-paying jobs, and forgives loans after 10 years for those in certain public service jobs, such as teachers, police officers, and AmeriCorps workers. Before becoming Secretary of Education, he served as the Chief Executive Officer of the Chicago Public School District, winning praise for uniting education reformers, teachers, principals, and business stakeholders behind an aggressive education reform agenda in Chicago. Secretary Duncan, on behalf of my fellow students, I am delighted to welcome you to UMBC today. Thank you so much. Great job. Knock that out. Thank you so much, Ganesh. I said all of us here work for the students, so please give him another round of applause. America's students know what they want out of college. They want an education that will set them on a path to success. They want control of their future without decades of overwhelming debt. They want a college degree that will help them thrive, support a family, shape the world, and contribute to their communities. For many students, that's not just a dream. For them, our nation's world-class colleges and universities and strong credential programs offer a clear path to civic engagement, economic security, and success. For them, college is literally a transformative time in their lives that shapes their future in profoundly positive ways. But unfortunately, for millions of other students, our higher education system isn't delivering what they need or deserve. And as a nation, we can change that, and we must. The challenge we face is easy to articulate, if not to solve. Today, the critical ticket to the middle class is a degree or credential after high school that employers recognize and value. That's equally true whether you're fresh out of high school or a career changer with grown kids, whether you're headed for a leafy residential campus or to your local community college. The simple fact is, every hardworking student in this country must have a real opportunity to achieve a meaningful, affordable degree. America's prosperity, our democracy, and our identity is a land of opportunity and social mobility 
depends on it. But to get there, we have to think differently. The idea from the past century that public education only goes from kindergarten through high school is over. We must make the shift to a vision of quality education that begins much earlier in preschool and continues through post-secondary success. This administration has done a lot to help pave the way for progress, but there's a lot of heavy lifting and culture change ahead. Some of the change is about money. College costs too much for too many families, and the price continues to rise. Debt is a deep, deep worry that, uh, for far too many people that constrains opportunities post-graduation. But let's be clear, it's not just about cost and debt. Because the hard truth is, for all those who start college, it's a coin toss whether they'll get that critically important degree. Barely half will complete their degree in a reasonable time at four-year institutions, and at two-year schools, it's only about a third. At career colleges, even more will drop out, and more than three out of four of them will have debt. And some who attend unethical schools will end up with a credential that means little to nothing to employers. There is a path to a, higher, to a higher education system that serves many, many more students much better. And continuing to make college more accessible and affordable, including more tuition-free and debt-free degrees, is absolutely part of that. But it's only part. Simply put, if we limit the discussion to cost and debt, we will have failed. We will have only found better ways to pay for a system today that fails far too many of our students. Our vision must be bigger than that. Make no mistake, our administration will not let up in our efforts to help more students pay for college, to break the upward cycle of cost, to crack down on bad actors that take advantage of students and taxpayers. And we will continue to strengthen our enforcement efforts. But as a nation, we must go further. We must reset the incentives that underpin the system so the focus is on the outcome that matters, completing a quality degree at a reasonable cost. And we must have the courage to embrace innovations that meet the needs of a student body that has changed enormously in recent decades. Over time, as the need for a degree has increased, a much wider swath of the American population is enrolling in college, and that's a very good thing. Hollywood may depict college students as 18-year-olds in dorms, but nearly four out of every 10 college students today are older than 24 years old, and in community colleges, it's almost half. Older students are much more likely to work full-time and to juggle multiple roles, employee, spouse, and parent. And they are much less likely to enroll continuously full-time while they work to obtain their degree. In fact, more than a third of all undergraduates today transfer credits from one institution to another as they progress towards their degree. The heightened need for college and the far greater diversity of the population seeking it defines both the challenge and the amazing opportunity ahead of us. And the answer, I believe, requires three major shifts. First, dealing with cost and debt. Second, focusing much more on outcomes. And third, driving desperately needed innovation. Together, these changes represent the higher education challenge of our generation. And let's start with the primary worry for so many students and their families today. A spiral of cost and debt threatens to take college, America's engine of social mobility, and kick it into reverse. Over the past three decades, tuition at four-year schools has more than doubled, even after adjusting for inflation. The consequences are significant. Over the last two decades, the average amount owed by a student loan borrower more than doubled to nearly $27,000. And the very fear about cost and debt stops millions of students from even pursuing or finishing the education they need. The need is urgent to rein in the cost of college, to create more tuition-free and zero-debt pathways, and to reverse the shocking slide in state support for higher education, which is the primary driver behind escalating tuition. In the face of these challenges, I'm proud to say that our administration has taken unprecedented action. President Obama has laid out the America's College Promise Plan, now introduced and awaiting action in Congress. The bill would provide zero tuition community college to nine million students each year at 1,300 community colleges, making two years of college as universal as high school became in the 20th century to the great benefit of our nation's economy. 
We've cracked down on predatory and fraudulent behavior, reigning in bad actors that saddle students with debt and worthless degrees. And we've dramatically expanded financial aid for low-income students and their families. Since 2008, our administration has increased total aid available to students by over $50 billion and increased tax benefits and credits by an additional $12 billion, all part of a total of about $150 billion in grants and loans each year for higher education. More than 2 million additional students now receive Pell Grants, and the maximum Pell Award has increased by more than $1,000. Many of those additional 2 million students are first-generation college goers who now have their chance to pursue the American dream. We've implemented a series of reforms that aim to drive down the cost of college and to help more students afford it. A simpler online FAFSA has helped to raise the number of completed applications by nearly 4.8 million over five years. And we're working to make both the real cost and benefits of college far more transparent to students and their families. With the launch of the college scorecard, the voluntary adoption of the financial aid shopping sheet by more than 3,000 institutions, and additional comparative information on outcomes and college value we will make, that we will make available later this summer, consumers will have much better information about their college choices. Transparency will also drive accountability to improve results. And we're working to make, uh, to make debt much more manageable. As late as mi mid-2012, fewer than a million borrowers were in income-driven repayment plans, which allow borrowers to cap their monthly payments based on what they earn. President Obama's expansion effort has nearly quadrupled participation, with both delinquencies and defaults down. In very real terms, this means that the young man or woman who dreams of being a teacher, a social worker, an artist, or a nurse, now knows that they can pursue their passion without having to worry about unmanageable debt that will prevent them from buying their first house or a car. That's good for them, it's good for our economy, and it's good for our society. But there's so much further we need to go in order to make college more affordable. A lot of my friends here in Washington have been talking about the need for debt-free degrees. And they're right. Students must have many more pathways to tuition and debt-free degrees. The America's College Promise Plan is a huge part of helping us get there. We want to do even more, developing experimental sites that will make Pell Grants available to programs that award credentials based on demonstrated competency to incarcerated adults seeking an independent, productive life after they get out of jail, and to adult learners who enroll in short-term certificate programs that provide meaningful, job-ready training. But cost and debt are just one part, one part of this fight. Student debt is a burden for too many students, but most ultimately repay their loans. And for those who get their degree, college is an excellent investment. By some estimates, a bachelor's degree increases lifetime earnings on average by about a million dollars. The degree students truly can't afford is the one they don't complete or that employers don't value. Students who drop out of school are three times more likely to default on their student loans as those who graduate. In fact, the amount of debt is not the main reason people default. The typical defaulted borrower is carrying less than $9,000 in debt. The completion challenge is not just hurting far too many individuals, it's costing us as a nation on an international scale. Even as a degree has become critical in a globally competitive economy, America has fallen from first in the world in the college completion rates of our young people to 12th. There can be no pride in that. College also must be an equalizer of opportunity, but the richest quarter of students are four times more likely than the poorest quarter to earn their bachelor's degree. Whether we look at overall completion rates or at inequalities in opportunity, clearly we are not close to where we need to be. We must shift incentives at every level to focus on student success, not just on access. When students win, everyone wins. But when they lose, every part of the system should share responsibility. Today, only students, their families, and taxpayers lose when students don't succeed. And that makes no sense. Institutions must be held accountable when they get paid by students and taxpayers but fail to deliver a quality education. So should states and accreditors 
who are responsible to oversee them under the law. By the same token, schools should be rewarded for doing the right thing, taking in students who are struggling and helping them to succeed. We must do so much more to support those colleges that have proven the ability to help first-generation college goers and poor students to both succeed and flourish in higher education. Thank you. <laughs> Federal and state governments and accreditors all need to flip the current incentives. Collectively, we must focus less on inputs, like enrollment and spending, and more on outputs, like completion rates and degrees awarded and whether those degrees have real value in the marketplace, especially for low-income students. LSU's president, who you'll hear from later, King Alexander, has said that higher education needs real accountability, not less of it. That means everyone, Congress, states, accreditors, our Department of Education, all of us must do business differently. Let's start with Congress. In 2006, under a Republican president, the Spellings Commission on, it, on Higher Education found, and I quote, a remarkable absence of accountability mechanisms to ensure that colleges succeed in educating our students. Over the past decade, quite frankly, not much has changed. Congress delegated the role of quality assurance to accreditors, and Congress, with the support of the higher education lobby, has actually barred the federal government from establishing criteria for accrediting agencies to assess student achievement. Likewise, many members of Congress, Democratic and Republican, continue to try to block our efforts to protect students and taxpayers from unethical career colleges. President Obama has put forward far-reaching proposals to encourage states to stop disinvesting and increase support for higher education and reward institutions for achieving great outcomes for low-income students. Congress has not acted on those proposals. I remain hopeful that Congress will act on America's college promise that's just one way Congress can follow the lead of successful states like Tennessee and take good work to scale. I hope, too, that Congress will reverse its opposition to accountability in higher education and join our efforts to improve student outcomes. Students, their families, and the American taxpayers who fund this enterprise, they all deserve better. As it stands, where Congress has asked for little accountability, accreditors have provided little. For the most part, Accreditation organizations are the watchdogs that don't bark. According to a recent Wall Street Journal investigation, 11 schools with six-year graduation rates in the single digits, below 10%, still manage to earn a seal of approval from accreditors. When asked if a college with a 10% graduation rate can be doing a good job, the accreditor responded, it can be a good school for those 10% who graduate. The six organizations that accredit 1,500 four-year colleges rescinded membership for just 18 schools. And even Corinthian colleges remained accredited right up to their recent bankruptcy. As one leading accreditor acknowledged, accreditation, and I'm quoting, undeniably and unapologetically looks at inputs. For many accreditors, student outcomes are way down the priority list. The current system of continuous improvement is in desperate need of its own improvement. We need to build a system in which student learning, graduation, and going on to get good jobs count most. That's what it means to focus on outcomes. We as a department must do a better job of holding accreditors responsible for their work, but we need Congress to take action and not tie our hands. States, as well, must do business differently. It is to their credit that so many states have come together at the K-12 level, adopting learning standards aligned to success in college, an enormous effort by educators and political leaders that will pay off hugely for students over time. In the past, far too many high school graduates arrived in college needing remediation. Higher and better aligned standards will help to change that. But the widespread cutbacks that states have made in their higher education budgets desperately need to be reversed. In all, 47 states cut per student spending between 2009 and 2014 by an average of about 13%. Over the past 25 years, state per student spending is down 25% after adjusting for inflation. For each dollar states put in higher education today, the federal government invests more than two. This pattern of state disinvestment and the expectation that the federal government will cover the shortfall has to end. States, as well as Washington, need to remember that higher education is a public good. 
States like Alaska, Illinois, and North Dakota have done just that. They increased funding for education even as the economy faltered. I'm delighted, however, that a growing number of colleges and universities have stepped up themselves to find new ways to expand opportunity and hold themselves accountable for serving more of today's students better. Building on efforts in places like Tennessee and Kalamazoo and Chicago, leaders in Oregon and Harper College in Illinois and in Philadelphia are already helping to realize the president's vision to provide two years of college to responsible students at no cost. Right here at UMBC, under President Rabowski's extraordinary leadership, more African-American bachelor degree recipients go on to earn PhDs in STEM fields than from any predominantly white university. UMBC's Meyerhoff Scholars Program has pioneered a comprehensive approach to recruiting and supporting minority students. So far, over 900 students have graduated and 600 have gone on to earn advanced degrees. These scholars are five times as likely as similar students to have, to have graduated, from, graduated from or still be enrolled in a STEM doctoral program. The ASAP program at the City University of New York requires students to attend full-time and enroll in linked block courses. It's also providing targeted advising and financial supports, metro cards to make sure students can get to school, and free textbooks. The completion rate there was nearly double the rate for students who didn't participate. To me, so much of the promise for, for higher education lies in ideas just like these, and the genius and creativity of forward-looking educators like those that will be on our panel a little bit later. These leaders understand and celebrate higher education as a public good, but they're not stopping with that recognition. Against the odds, they're leading a quiet revolution that must succeed if we're to realize higher education success for millions and millions of additional students. The old school, traditional higher education model that held place and time constant, students went to classes and the time needed to complete a class or degree was fixed. What varied was learning and completion. In the future, I believe post-secondary educations will literally flip that, being far more flexible about both time and place and ways of learning and awarding credit for competencies gained. Increasingly, they will enable students to customize their post-secondary education in different times and places over their entire lifetimes, accumulating credentials that educators call portable and stackable. To state the obvious, I don't see a future where any post-secondary option, including residential, liberal arts colleges, disappears. Instead, the aim should be to create more post-secondary more post-secondary options that do a better job of meeting everyone's needs. The liberal arts must remain strong. Our nation needs campuses where professors aspire to become top flight teachers and leading researchers look for the next big discovery to help humanity, whether that's a cure for cancer, the next amazing technology, or breakthrough ideas. But too many liberal arts colleges and research universities have built their brands on exclusivity for far too long. It's time to bring to an end a false choice between excellence and access. Excellence plus equity is a powerful win-win. Just look at research institutions like Arizona State University and selective liberal arts colleges like Vassar and Franklin and Marshall. ASU awards about 60% more degrees today than it did a decade ago, while the number of African American and, His and Hispanic students at ASU has doubled during that same period. Franklin and Marshall has doubled its enrollment of low-income and first-generation students without any dip in graduation rates. At Vassar, the percentage of students eligible for a Pell Grant rose 11 percentage points in recent years. Southern New Hampshire University, the University of Wisconsin, and others have demonstrated that flexible, competency-based programs make it possible for employed moms returning veterans and displaced workers to have access to innovative programs at low and reasonable costs. And we're proud to support a broad range of innovation efforts through our First in the World Fund, which fosters innovations that drive down the cost of college. And I hope Congress will reject Republican plans to zero out its funding and continue to invest in this initiative to produce evidence of what works at scale. My three broad themes today will guide our approach to reauthorization of the Higher Education Act as they have guided our work from the very beginning. First, we will be seeking to make college more affordable 
financial aid more accessible, and loan repayment easier. Second, we will concentrate on boosting student success through shared responsibility and accountability for outcomes. And third, we will promote innovation and competition through transparency and evidence of what works. We will look to provide incentives for states, post-secondary institutions, and students themselves to work to improve outcomes, enabling millions more students to graduate in a timely manner with a quality degree and land a good job. We will work with states and colleges and accreditors in a shared partnership with cleared responsibilities to increase accountability for student success in higher education. We will strive to reward success, especially where universities are demonstrating their commitment to better serving disadvantaged students. And we'll work to protect taxpayers and students from those who seek to take advantage of them. The challenge before us is enormous, as are the stakes. But I'm very, very hopeful. I take heart from both the genius and creativity of visionaries like those gathered in this room and around the nation. I believe that with your leadership and with the collective courage and commitment, our nation will advance the work of perfecting the full promise of higher education. This is not just an economic imperative, it's a moral necessity. Ensuring the opportunity for college success for all students who are willing to work hard is a core tenet of the American covenant. As President Obama told the NAACP earlier this month, justice is not only the absence of oppression, it's the presence of opportunity. The decisions we face here will define our generation. In the choices we make, we will decide what kind of country we are and who gets to share in our nation's success. Because of your leadership, I'm convinced we have a better chance of getting this right. Thank you so much. Let's start our conversation. You got enough seats? Great. You're the moderator? No, I'll stay, I'll stay here. Okay, You're okay, good. all right. <laughs> so we, we have an amazing panel. Um, I have questions for every panelist, but we keep this very informed. If people want to jump in or elaborate on something else, feel free to do that. And we're not rushing here. We've got a little bit of time. But uh, this is your home, Dr. Rowski. I'll yes. start, start with you. Talk to me about two things. One, obviously, the results you're getting are disproportionately high compared to what other folks are getting with similar students. Right. I'm always interested in scale. Right. What are the lessons that are scalable? And two, I thought it'd just be interesting for the audience. You have a pretty unique background. Mm -hmm. A lot of us have studied the civil rights movement. A lot of us are inspired by it. You lived it in a pretty difficult way. If you could maybe just take a moment and talk about your time as an 11-year-old and uh, how that shapes your work and then practically what you've done here, there's implications for the nation. Sure. When I want to get the attention of, of children, I tell them that I spent a week in jail. And they always look to see what that's about. And it was because I had the chance to participate in the Civil Rights Children's March in Birmingham, my hometown. And what that experience taught me was that even children can be empowered to take ownership of their education. And you can learn a lot. And what we learned as children in Birmingham was the importance of critical thinking skills. Uh, and I think that the lesson today for those of us in education and higher education is the importance of civ civic engagement, of understanding the challenges we face in our society, of finding ways of getting students involved in working with families and children and in our society. And, and the larger point about the scale up of any innovation, it seems to me the, the essence, uh, the theme should be knocking down the boundaries across sectors, public and private sectors. I was delighted to look and see uh, Delegate uh, Speaker Pro Tem Adrian Jones in the audience and Senator Curry, two of our elected officials, for example, or Dallas Dance I saw somewhere who is uh, over Baltimore County Schools. I mean, the idea of higher education, you need to have K-12 in the audience pre-K through 12 in the audience when talking about higher ed. You need to have elected officials in the audience. You need to have two-year and four-year institutions. And the key for, it seems to me, scale up is to look at the culture of institutions to see what we're doing well and how we go about building on what works and being honest with ourselves about what does not work. That's the challenge. Thank you. 
we just go right down, I guess, uh, President Quillen, you've done some really interesting work recently. We all worry about access. We worry about the has and the have nots. You guys of edX, the college board, are looking to make AP classes available online for free. What does that work look like? What does that mean to your faculty? You're a relatively small private school, but the impact you can have is extraordinary beyond your walls. Tell me what that's like. Well, at, at Davidson, um, where I'm privileged to work and learned a lot in New President's School from this guy right here, um, <laughs> we believe that our commitment to educational access goes beyond the 2,000 students that we are able to directly serve. So education is a calling for us. How can we take responsibility for ensuring that, that all children who are our children, all children are our children, have the opportunity for the education that they deserve and are entitled to and that our democratic society needs. So our faculty are working with master high school AP teachers together with the college board and edX to produce blended learning curricula for use either alone as a MOOC or in a classroom with a teacher that will give more students access to rigorous curricula in AP classes. The, our aim is to ensure that those students can succeed in those subjects, not just do well on the test, but succeed in those subjects throughout college in addition to getting credit for the AP exam, which can cut lots of cost off their college degree. So we are piloting those modules now in our home district, which is Charlotte Mecklenburg Public Schools. And our hope is that um, once, we have the, once we have them as effective as they could possibly be, that we'll release them and they'll be used nationwide. That's one way in which a liberal arts institution, which by, by nature and by the kind of education that we offer, is a small residential institution. That's one way that we can scale up our commitment to educational excellence and access. And if I could just say as a historian by training that access is not in opposition to excellence, but excellence requires access because the knowledge we produce is only as good as the questions we ask. And when you have a homogeneous group of people asking the questions, all their blind spots are the same, and the narratives we produce about our own culture and past are distorted. They're not just incomplete, they're distorted. So you cannot produce accurate knowledge without a diverse body of people asking the questions. So to those people who say excellence, requ you know, access requires that we compromise excellence, I say no, you can't actually be what you claim to be, a knowledge producing and disseminating institution, if you haven't made some provision for access and cultivating a heterogeneous body of inquirers. Excellent. Thank you. Uh... President Alexander, most folks don't ask for more accountability, or re real accountability, that's a little bit different. And uh, why do you think it's so important that sharing outcomes-based information is critical for the future of higher ed? Well, I think that the efforts that you've made and the department have made to try to bring forth good information is exactly what I know our parents and students want. And good information is, we had to get, get it in law that institutions had to admit 10 years ago, had to admit what their student indebtedness was upon graduation. We're fighting to keep default rates in the eyes of beholders, so public money follows. That was the first issue that California dealt with Corinthian colleges, was a very high default rate. Uh, we need to be much more accountable. I mean, our parents want outcomes. We published many of the things that the federal rating system would have done already. The college scorecard is a, is, was an early part of that, and it's available for parents, but we want parents to have information. Our parents know more about the cars they drive or the cars they buy with a blue book than they know about the colleges that they invest in their students and their kids' lifetime. And we, we welcome a blue book for higher education to, to measure the effectiveness and the value of both institutions and of states. Thank you. Um, President Mello, take a minute, talk to folks about what your average student looks like. Again, the non-traditional has become the norm of the traditional. You've also done some really interesting things to increase student engagement and success. You've been successful with some of our first in the world grants. Talk to the audience about what your students look like and what you're trying to do to help more students not just enroll, gain access, but actually complete. Thank you, Secretary. So at LaGuardia Community College, we have about 60,000 students. We're in big old factory buildings in um, Queens, New York. Uh, about uh, half of our students were not born in the United States, and they come from 160 different countries, and they speak 110 different languages. I always say it's not because we're smart, we're just lucky. We're in Queens, it's where there's a lot of immigration. 
But there's a real vitality there, and you can feel the vitality of the future of the United States when you come to LaGuardia. It's, it's pretty extraordinary. But to serve that kind of community, to serve public school students who grow up poor in New York City, you have to really understand um, a couple of things. One is you really have to understand financing. And that's why in New York, I think I'm so excited about the American College promise that, that you, um, Secretary Duncan, and, the, and President Obama have talked about. Because we do really have to reset. What's the norm? Because we have to agree high school's not enough. And that's a big thing for the United States. I think we also have to look at funding. So um, community colleges in the United States spend less per student than the elementary school does in your area. And to really deal with students whose lives are really tough, and as the secretary said, who aren't just students, they're also parents, they're employers, they're taking care of um, family members, have to really sort of rethink what college is. So one of the things that the First in the World grant allowed us to do, and I have to say parenthetically, when we applied for something, Secretary Duncan, that was called First in the World, it sounded like such hubris until we got it, and then I really liked the title. <laughs> but what we decided is that to really make something work, it's got to be a system. So you've mentioned some great programs, and programs are exciting. They show us how things can be done. But for example, the wonderful ASAP program that the city of New York funds, tremendous success, costs about $4,000 more per student per year. That's enormous. And so what we've really been using the First in the World grant to do is three major things. One is, you know, there are millions, close to probably 20 million Americans who don't have a high school diploma. And what we're going to do with those folks, folks who don't even make it through high school, is really important. So one of the first in the world activities is to bridge between the GED program and, um, high, and college education so that there really is that seamless connection. And that has been very exciting to do. The second thing we want to do is really make sure that faculty become very central to what goes on. They're the, um, often the missing person in the equation about who in the system can make a difference. So really investing in faculty, investing in their education. I've been doing some great work around the country with an online professional development activity that helps faculty where they are, especially adjunct faculty. And what we're interested in doing there is helping faculty learn how to deal with this very new group of students. There are students in these classes nobody has ever seen before, sitting side by side. And so helping faculty introduce students to the intellectual um, discipline, to understanding you know, what is psychology, what is economics, what is education. And we found that just that has increased student retention and credit accumulation by 10% in our first year. We're really excited by that. And then the second piece is to really do advising in a very different way. Um, students come in, first generation, poor students, they have no idea what a credit or a non-credit is. They don't know what financial aid progress standards mean. You really have to help them. But I have one um, academic advisor for every 3,700 students at LaGuardia. So I'd need a lot more to do that. And we knew that we couldn't get funding. So we've brought in peer advising. We've created teams so that faculty are now involved, not in choosing Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, but really thinking through what should higher education mean. So it's really investing in faculty. It's really using technology appropriately. But it's thinking as a system that we've been very excited by. And our initial results from the First in the World grant are very promising. You know, she says something that's very important. I, I think the public needs to understand that people on these campuses really do care about students, that faculty and staff care deeply about these students and have been able to help a lot of students already but need to help more, and we know, we know. We look in the mirror and we say, yeah, we can do an even better job. I think one of the things has to be specificity when thinking about the kinds of students. You know, it's understandable that New York has students from 100 and some countries, but you don't think of the South like Baltimore is having that, and yet we've got over 100 countries represented on this campus. Mm -hmm. Now, you've got first-generation college students, but saying first-generation college is not enough. 
because I've got first-generation college kids coming out of Cherry Hill, for example, or out of West Baltimore, and then first-generation college kids who may, whose parents may be from Russia, they are very different. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. being able to specify the needs of the students, knowing the students well enough, having advocates for those students, taking the caring attitude that faculty and staff have, using the technology that we have, all right, and taking a system approach, for example, Bob Corrett is here, for the University System of Maryland to, to figure out how do we work effectively with all these different types of students and be honest with ourselves about what we're doing well and what we need to improve on can make a big difference. Yeah, thank you. President Wilson, uh, two things. One is we talk a lot about equity and first-generation college goers, and you've lived this in a way that not everyone here has. So you could, your background is a little different than uh, most college presidents. If you could tell folks a little bit about your upbringing and also, by any measure, the underrepresentation of minorities and African Americans in the STEM fields is a huge challenge. And again, it's never STEM against liberal arts. We need more right. of both. That's a false choice. Right. But we have to get more young people of color. Give him a hand for saying that, that it's a false <laughs> choice to be there. I like that. That's a good thing. If you could talk a little bit about your background and why that motivates you to do what you do and also what you're doing to get more young folks of color into the STEM field. Uh, sure. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Secretary, let me just say that I'm really honored to be president at Morgan State University, uh, a university that is very close to the vision that you just articulated for the future of higher education. Um, and as Freeman is apt to say, uh, he went to jail. Uh, we grew up in Alabama. Uh, he grew up in Birmingham, but I grew up in rural Alabama. And so our experiences are worlds apart. And so if Freeman went to jail, I like to say that I was basically in prison. Uh, and, so, um, and so with, with that said, uh, let me just kind of give you a window uh, into my upbringing, because I do think that the way I have approached my presidency at Morgan and my chancellorship in Wisconsin and at Rutgers and other places is certainly derivative of that type of experience. Um, so uh, I grew up in rural Alabama uh, on a little red dirt road in a shanty uh, with no electricity, uh, with no plumbing, uh, none of the so-called modern conveniences. Uh, my father was a sharecropper. Uh, that meant that he lived on property that was owned by whites. And at the end of each year, we farmed cotton and okra and those kinds of uh, crops. Um, he was supposed to share in whatever profits that were generated, but of course there were never ever any profits, and so we got deeper and deeper and deeper into debt. Um, he had 10 children, um, the youngest of 10 children. Uh, my father was illiterate, of course, uh, and my first five brothers are all illiterate today. Um, and in this set, I, I sort of went to this one room school, the Rosenwald School there, that basically housed six grades in one building, uh, one room with a big pot belly stove or so in the center. Um, and uh, basically, I was in the seventh grade um, before I attended school five consecutive days. And so one day I said to my father, I said, you know, um, I want to go to college. And he looked at me and he said, son, college. Uh, he said, in that particular time, uh, college is for white people. And he didn't say any more about college, and I didn't either. And so five years passed, and it's now August the 26th, 1973, and I am about to leave this shanty to go off to college. Uh, and I got up about 4.30 in the morning, and he uh, got up as well, uh, and he came and he joined me there in uh, the little front room, as we called it, before we went onto the porch. And he said to me, he said, uh, David, he said, you know, five years ago, you said to me that you wanted to go to college, and do you recall what I said to you? And I said, uh, of course, Daddy, I recall. Uh, how could I forget it? It was devastating. He said, but you need to know what I was really thinking. He said, what I was really thinking was, how in the hell am I ever going to afford to send you to college? Mm -hmm. And that's why I did not engage you in that conversation anymore. But he said, you know, I have been saving for this day uh, when you would go out of this house and go to college. And so he reached in his overalls and he pulled out something that he called a piece of money. Uh, and he asked if I would open my hand, which I did, and he put this piece of money into my hand and he put his hand over mine and he said, son, 
use this wisely. Use it wisely. And when I opened the front door as the sun was coming up and opened my hand, uh, there in my hand was a crisp $5 bill. Uh, that was really what my father had saved for five years to send me to college. And so college, for me, getting there and staying there was a struggle. Um, I was not supposed to go. Uh, I understand the limitations. I understand the gaps, the academic gaps that some students have, but the enormous potential that they have. I understand the cost barriers. And uh, with individuals like Shirley Malcolm, who is a member of our Board of Regents at Morgan, we pay a lot of attention to keeping the institution in a position where cost is not going to be a major inhibitor. Uh, and so uh, I really value the work that I do, the space that I do it in. Uh, let me just conclude this section, though, by saying that at Morgan, uh, what makes, I think, Morgan so central uh, to the kind of conversation that we are having is the incredible productivity of the institution. Uh, we are number one in the United States in producing black electrical engineers. Uh, we are number one in producing black civil engineers. Uh, we are number one in producing black industrial engineers. Uh, the National Science Foundation did a study a year ago looking at all blacks in the United States uh, who had gone on to get PhDs in engineering and science between 2008 and 2012. Where did they get their undergraduate degrees? Morgan State University in engineering was number two in the country. Um, and they broke it down by gender. And in terms of all black females who had gone on to get PhDs in engineering, between 2008 and 2012, Morgan State University, number one in the country. Mm. And we're number two in the country in terms of black males. And so um, there's a great ecosystem at Morgan uh, that starts with uh, leadership. And as Freeman indicated, the incredible commitment on the part of the faculty to the mission of the institution. And we want to make sure that we scale that up uh, even more going forward, because that institution has enormous potential to uh, produce even more than it is producing now. Um, Chancellor uh, Zimfer, uh, SUNY, not a small system. In fact, it's the largest in the nation, uh, almost 500,000 students, 60 institutions. So I started talking about scale. You work at scale every single day. So you've done a lot to drive access, to drive quality, to keep costs down. How do you do that at scale? And again, there's these false choices between bricks and mortar and online, and you're bridging that divide in some pretty interesting ways. So how are you driving quality at such a massive scale, and what are you doing in this blended learning space? Well, that's uh, right in my uh, wheelhouse, I guess. I, I want to thank you first, Secretary, for the message. Uh, we're not going to leave uh, cost behind. We're not going to leave access behind. But it is about completion with this little formula uh, at SUNY, and maybe this is what's helping us stay focused, called A plus C equals S. Uh, so we know what access is. We're talking a lot more about completion. We're adding success because I think it's uh, replete in your remarks that it is about getting a job. For many, it is about going to graduate school, but most people want to come out gainfully employed. And uh, so we've sort of taken on that responsibility as well by trying to provide for every one of our students an applied learning opportunity. I'm an educator, so I'm shocked that we're still on John Dewey uh, many years after uh, he said that people learn by doing. But that's just to illustrate what I think success could mean for us. That said, um, I think systems have a very important obligation. Uh, you noted we have not moved the dial in our completion first in the world agenda as much as we might have hoped. And yet, for campus presidents, it's always about what we do really well. Uh, and we do, we're, we're paid to brag a lot about what we do really well. And we are good. But we are not good enough if 40% or 35% of the students who come to us never see the end game, even after six years. I, I think we've got some of our students thinking the six-year graduation rate is the graduate. No, no, it's not. Ask your parents. It's four <laughs> or it's two. Uh, it's not six. So as a system, we went public in January, and we said, we're not good enough. We're good, but not good enough. And we gave the state of New York a number. We said that we thought in five years we could move 
degree completers. Degree completion from 93,000 degrees offered a year, which is a big number, over the next five years to 150,000 degrees. And in that time, use only what works. This is what our problem is. We don't like to let go of things we've been doing forever that, in fact, employ an industry. Look at the people employed to deliver remediation. What is their incentive to fix the problem if we don't redefine what we need to do to get every student to degree completion or, I should add, the credibility of badges or micro uh, credentials, we've got to move there. So we set this ambitious number. We are only investing in evidence-based strategies, and we are partnering extensively with K-12. I think uh, higher ed has had a little bit of an attitude. Uh, you send us better prepared students, we'll do a better job. When, in fact, we prepare the teachers who teach the students who come to college, ready or not. True confession. That's our job, too. So uh, in the interest of scale, there are 44 systems around the country that have the statutory authority to educate students. And these systems educate 75% of the undergraduate population in this country. Bob Carrat is here, leading the University of Maryland system. He's a member of that effort. And we, too, gave the president a very ambitious goal that over the next 10 years, we could get 350,000 more degree completers. That's how we're going to move America's dial. So as good as we are, and as much as we like to talk about our successes, they're still at the micro level. Mm -hmm. And the only way we're going to take what works to scale is to decide what to do and to decide what not to do. So these systems have decided to do three things. One, we do like the concept of using data to predict success. It's called predictive analytics, and Tennessee is very good at it, and Tennessee is going to share it with the rest of us. Uh, Gail knows that we've found a pathway to math success, which has been a huge barrier for transfer students and for college freshmen, particularly from community colleges, but let's face it, in our four-year institutions as well. So we're going to focus on very evidence-based math pathway. Carnegie Foundation, you featured them at the summit. We think that's a path forward. And then the third thing, high-impact strategies, like the kind of advising and commitment and full-time enrollment and graduation guarantees. And if that many systems can just do three things right, I think in five to 10 years, we really can move the dial. So thank you, Mr. Secretary. It's a privilege to be here at this institution that you, and, and to sit on this panel with you all. And I think one of the things that will make possible moving the needle significantly across the country are new kinds of partnerships. Mm -hmm. Freeman, you talked about cross-sector partnerships, working with K-12, but it's K-12, it's venture philanthropy, it's government agencies, it's teachers, and it's also employers. And in order to do that, I think we have to find a language to talk about education that resonates with everyone. So I'm a teacher, and I care about learning. I love like to learn, and I want my students to love to learn. So we can speak in the language of learning, in addition to the language of outcomes, or speak in the language of, of student success, or acknowledge that all American children are our children and our future. And then I think. The, those who imagine education, as everyone on this panel and the secretary does, as a calling, hear their sel themselves and their work in that. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it is predictive analytics. I love data as much as the next person. I believe our graduation rate should be 100% at Davidson College and that our students should graduate with, if, if any debt, manageable debt and a great job. But I also listen to our faculty who, who feel their own calling to help cultivate in our, the next generation a love of learning, productive learning, career-oriented learning, or learning that will help them be successful. But, but we have to talk to the folks who do the actual work. And, and that, to me, is their, their language, is 
this language of, of learning and calling and, and the next generation and, and the future and the promise of the American And dream. that's what it means to build on the strengths of the academy. People do believe in having a lust for learning and that learning can make a difference. Whether it's the researcher who's focusing on a problem and research is a part of this, it really is, or it's the teacher, not only for K-12, but pre-K. Let me just make it very clear. Pre-K-12, very, very important to say that. And what I would, what I would argue is that we, we need language that pulls people in, inclusiveness, that will pull people in to get them talking about it in a way that people understand that it does require a change in culture as we think about working with different sectors in different ways and listening to what we need and listening to our students. Let me say that, because sometimes we, we assume we know What's going on? We need to understand their perspective, their background, what they bring to the table, David. You know, what, what, what have they had before they even got here? So it's the listening that is as important as anything else. But you're absolutely right. Absolutely. Uh, President Rawls, uh, fantastic job running the North Carolina Community College System, coming out of NOVA, which is a fantastic system. Talk to me about two things. One, what you've done to increase dual enrollment for high school students taking college credit, which I think is not just for high achieving kids, it's a great dropout prevention strategy and first generation college goers start to believe that they belong on campus. And then two, I talked a lot about real training leading to real jobs. So how in community colleges can you have assurance or do you, do you uh, investigate to find out whether what you're offering employers are really asking for and there's a clear pipeline into the workforce? Okay. Well, thank you for having me. Um, dual enrollment, meaning uh, High school students taking college courses while in high school have always been a big part of North Carolina. We've always had a very strong, or let's say uh, broad dual enrollment program. And the biggest thing that we have been able to do in North Carolina in the last 10 years is probably the early college high schools. We have about a third of all the early college high schools in the United States in North Carolina. But the big lesson there has been that it's not just about providing access to college courses. It's really about the pathways that students are on. And we do a lot of pathway conversation now, particularly in community colleges. But I think when you step back, the big lesson there as well is for us in higher ed, when we talk about pathways, they often begin and end within our institutions. And that's not the way it is for our students. Our students' pathways begin and in high school and oftentimes come to community colleges, then go to university. Sometimes they come back to community colleges. So the pathways have to be thought through beyond high school or beyond institutions. And so that's what I think has been unique for us in recent years is about having collective conversations where students just don't enroll in high school or college courses, but they enroll in pathways that go between high schools to community colleges. It's also, I think, important in our engagement with employers. Uh, community colleges in North Carolina were known for that employer engagement. It requires constant engagement, constant competency conversations. But what's also important there is that those conversations are collective conversations, not just one-off conversations. It's important with our employers. We need our employers to work together in defining competencies in particular industries that give us targets to hit. But then it's also important for us in terms of how we work across institutions to hit those. So, you know, in, recently in North Carolina, we, over 100 days, we visited over 1,100 employers with our public school partners, with our workforce board partners, uh, over 10 in each of our 100 counties. And, and so I think that, that much of what we're learning now is, I often say community colleges play a unique role as a seam and seamless education. And what that means though is that we have to see beyond our institutional borders. And I think that's really what's necessary for all of higher education and all of education now because our students uh, are not just students at particular institutions, they're students that cut across in their pathways certainly travel across multiple institutions. Can I uh, add to that, Secretary, that we too have about uh, 50 early college high schools in, in New York State, and it really has sent a message that we have to start earlier than grade 13. Uh, and I think what we're learning is we have to start earlier than grade 9, uh, or grade 6, or grade 3. Uh, and we have a lot of intellect in the university around early childhood, around prenatal care, around reading in the third grade and third grade level. But I still think we're a little bit in parallel play. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that we have to counter, and I like the seam and the seamless and the pipeline and the cradle to career, this is all language that's probably new to us in the last five or six years, where we understand that we really should be 
join together in this effort. And I think to reach, ultimately, the goal of uh, first in the world, higher ed has to step out of its comfort zone. And K-12 probably has to accept us for who we are, not trying to fix them, but trying to work with them. And that whole uh, brigade of early childhood Head Start deliverers, so that we can create an integrated path putting the student first. I, I think we often hear it's about the children, and I think on many days, no, I, I think it's about the adults. <laughs> and if we can get the child in the center and the student, we can do what, what you're doing in North Carolina. Let's go. King and, then, King and then David and Freeman. You mentioned the partners, and this is where we need your help. For 80% of the students, and you've mentioned this numerous times in your speeches, and we've talked about it an awful lot, but the big partner that's leaving the table are our states yep. and our state legislators. And we're losing, we're 50% down from where we were in 1980 in effort for spending for higher education. Mm -hmm. The last 50 years of the Higher Education Act was about saving private higher education, which we've done. And we did, we've made it so lucrative for profits, we can't even reel them in. Uh, the next 50 years ought to be about saving public higher education, and we've got great examples, and you've led many of those charges, from putting maintenance of effort provisions in the stimulus packages, which wouldn't let our states cut below 2006 funding levels. The American College promise, the Tennessee plan, what most of the press hasn't seen, the Tennessee plan isn't simply about giving 75% of community college tuition and fees to the student. It's actually holding Tennessee accountable for a three-year FTE average of what they're spending on two- and four-year students. So Tennessee can only be a part of this plan if they don't cut higher education anymore. If nothing is done, in 10 years, Colorado will be the first state not to spend a penny on higher education in 2025. Louisiana, 2027. Iowa, 2029. Minnesota, Arizona. They're falling off the charts. And this is where $170 billion in federal leverage funds could really put the right pressure and incentivize states to be that partner that's been getting out of this for years. I would actually just like to go back to the points raised by my colleagues from the two-year system. Um, I, I think there is certainly an opportunity for two-year and four-year to collaborate uh, even more than we are now. And um, one of the things that we have uh, done at uh, Morgan is to look at uh, how can we increase the transfer rates uh, yeah. of students coming from two-year institutions into Morgan without correspondingly having to increase the cost. Uh, and so we looked at a number of low enrollment programs at the institution where if you brought in another 25 or 30 students or 100 students per se, uh, you don't necessarily have to add new faculty, you don't necessarily have to add to the overhead. Uh, and in collaboration with our uh, two-year uh, institutions here in the state and then nationally, we announced a program two years ago where we said to um, students, if you go to the two-year institution and you get your associate degree, in these 13 areas, we identified 13 disciplines, you could actually then transfer to Morgan uh, and we would provide you up to 10 semesters of free tuition. Um, and um, that would be for two years, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, it would be over five year period to get your baccalaureate degree. And we've had a number of students to take advantage of that and that has not really led to additional cost on the part of the institution, but what it did was it created some space for the four-year institutions to sit down in earnest conversation uh, with our two-year uh, presidents to say, well, how can we work collaboratively together? And I think the same thing is happening with regard to uh, early college as well. Uh, we are going down this space. I think it's a space that not many HBCUs have gone down, uh, but we at Morgan are piloting this. We have two institutions in Baltimore, two high schools. Um, we started last year uh, where we're bringing those students now to Morgan for, um, for college credit, uh, ninth graders, 10th graders, 11th graders. Uh, so I th think the whole point is that we certainly have to look at how we can be more innovative in this space and uh, lead to some of the outcomes that Nancy and others are talking about here. Thank you. You know, from some of you know the project, Project Lead the Way, that focuses on engineering in K-12, through all the way to the Gates program that we're working with in terms of two and four-year institutions. What I would say that David says is so correct and that, that we would agree with is building relationships among people. Because it's not about 
one institution and another. It really is about the people in those institutions that will make the difference. Well, it's a whole system, University System of Maryland. It is about how faculty get to know faculty across in within disciplines, from the two-year institutions, K through 12, pre-K through 12, the higher education institutions, and how you build a kind of trust where you talk about teaching and learning, what's working, and serving as advocates for people. That's, that's what, so it's the relationships that make the difference. And it's about having elected officials at things like this where they get to understand the issues. Because quite frankly, the legislators are our graduates. Remember that, all right? <laughs> they are good thinkers. They just need to understand the issues. So we have advocates who can go out there and talk about it. And this is what we wanted to do here. And this is what has made the difference in the state of Maryland. The other area that we've not talked about that's an elephant in the room that I want to throw out is that we talk about graduation rates and first-time, full-time freshmen. That's a 20th century model. Yeah. It just is. Because we're talking about almost half of people in higher education not just going through the regular way. They come in and out. Am I right? You know, and so we have not broadened the definition of graduation rate to think through how to include the success that all kinds of institutions have with people who come back into college and finish, not in a four-year period. Or, you know, it, they come in different ways, and we have not thought that through as we think about success and in increasing the number of degrees. And that's a part of innovation yeah. that we've not gotten to. Yeah. Thanks. Let's go Carol and uh, yeah. Well, one of the other partners I wanted to bring in, in the who we should partner with, is when you really deeply connect with employers, very interesting things happen. So I'll give you one example. We partnered with Weill Cornell, which is a big medical complex in New York City. And um, first of all, they didn't want to talk to a community college because, hey, you know, why, why don't we just talk to NYU if we're... And we said, well, we think you, we can help you. What is your worst labor problem? And they said it was turnover in something called the private physician's office. So they have doctors who are working in the hospital and doctors who have their, um, their private practice there. And they would only hire people with bachelor's degrees because they wanted people who presented well. And those people lasted about seven months on average. Mm. So the churn was incredible. And we said, no, if you sit and really help us, we will put together a 15-week certificate that um, folks will go into very low income. Most people who had a high school diploma had been underemployed. They come in. They work through it. It works to the specifications of the company. And even more importantly, once you're at Weill Cornell, you then get tuition reimbursement. So those low-income people then have support to continue education. And it's that kind of creativity that I think is really important, because businesses spend each year about what the US government does in training of their folks. Why we're running these two systems parallel is still sort of crazy. So I think the other real partner that, um, again, Secretary Duncan, the, the federal government has a bully yeah. pulpit, is yeah. to really bring in those employers, not with lip service, but as real partners. Scott? <clears throat> Excuse me. The discussion about outcomes and accountability is so important to what we're talking about. But it also then means we have to evolve beyond institutional outcomes and accountability to collective uh, accountability. And I'll just give you a couple examples. Um, our discussion ar in d around developmental education in community colleges, it's not that we haven't had outcomes and accountability, it's just, in, and this is our discovery in North Carolina that we've been going through, is that that existed with K-12, and then we had very separate, often not discussed, taking national tests, if you will, and we were crossing in the night. And so, Two-thirds of our high school students were graduating who started with us, started in remedial education. 14% of all of our course instruction was in developmental remedial education. But part of that big discussion was the fact that we had not collectively had discussion about what are the standards for college readiness. And that's not standards that can only be discussed by higher ed or K-12 alone. Uh, the same issues in terms of our partnerships with our university partners. Uh, we thought we had a great articulation agreement in North Carolina, but it turned out that less than 15% of our students who graduated or who moved on did under that articulation agreement. They were most moving out, so we had to figure out new forms of guarantees, but the, the performance is not about whether we're performing or the university's performing. It's about a collective ownership of that student who starts with us and then moves to the university, or truthfully starts in public schools in dual enrollment moves to us and moves to the university. So we have to think about outcomes 
and accountability across systems, and that makes it really difficult. There are about 65 communities across the country where there's a jointly issued report card where everybody puts their data in this report card, but the winner is Albany, Rochester, Yonkers, <laughs> Dallas, Seattle. These are communities where there's one table, all the key leaders are at that table, everybody owns the data, no finger pointing, and when you get to something beyond partnerships and you use the word collective impact, maybe one community at a time, yeah. Yeah. we can get there. Yeah. Let's go Dave and Carol, you get the final word. Can you ask them? No, I was just gonna say, oh. a lot, the assumption about those partnerships are, uh, it, this, educational leaders get together and they do it. Most of those aren't funded partnerships. They're not grant funded. Um, the Long Beach College Promise, the biggest surprise yeah. we had in Long Beach when people asked us, said, who's funding this? So no, nobody was funding it. We were working together, and it, the outcomes, we had a report card, and it proved over and over again useful to make that available to everybody. Right. Let's go David and Carol. In your opening uh, remarks, Mr. Secretary, you lamented the fact that the United States had fallen to 12th in the world yeah. with regard to college completion. And I just want to basically put an asterisk there and then uh, invoke a report that the Southern Education Foundation released uh, about six months ago that said for the very first time, um, the majority of K through 12 children in public schools in this country qualified for free and reduced yep. lunch. Yep. So if we're going to reach the goal that President Obama has set for the nation, which is a goal that we all embrace of having the United States lead the world again, we have to look at this sort of growing population that that Southern Education Foundation report um, addressed and that population is a brown population, and the population is very, very poor. Uh, and so in that connection, um, I began once again at Morgan to have conversations, particularly with faculty in STEM fields, saying, well, look, you know, we've been really, really great uh, at taking talent like the Southern Education Foundation report and turning that talent into some of the leading scientists and engineers in the country. How have you gone about doing that? And I have to invoke the name of one person uh, in particular, uh, Dr. Eugene Deloach, uh, who has been dean of the School of Engineering at Morgan for 31 years. And in my history, in looking at, or in looking at the history of American higher education, there has been no single individual other than he since 1636 when Harvard was established <laughs> who has produced more black engineers. Mm -hmm. And I ask him, well, what is the recipe in terms of scaling up? So if we're going to make sure that the population in the future that's going to be a more brown America is also going to be the population with the degrees to lead to innovation and competitiveness, uh, how do we basically take these young people and make sure they have those skills? And basically what he said was that, um, look, um, first of all, the undergraduate research experience is just phenomenal. And so if you can take these undergraduate students, and even though they may come to us not as college ready as we would like them to, but when you put them in the laboratory with that professor at the undergraduate level, magic happens. Mm -hmm. And it's no longer about passing the test. It's about becoming deeply engaged in the learning process. The light bulbs go on. And these are the students at Morgan who go on to the MITs and the Stanfords and get those degrees. So um, it's, it's a scaling up of a different kind. You know, how do you take that, if you will, and put it out there as an exemplar? Uh, because we do think that we are on to something in terms of how you can put these things together and make the kind of magic that we're talking about. Thanks. Uh, Carol, final word. I, it's a big responsibility. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, 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 I just I want to express, um, you know, on behalf of higher education, my gratitude to the administration for making it a priority. And I have a plea, and my plea is that if all of us in higher education, in K-12, in pre-K education, employers can genuinely embrace the goal of ensuring that all children have access to equal educational opportunity, if we really take that goal seriously, then each of us will figure out what our part in that achieving that goal is. 
And it's gonna be different at a place like Davidson and, and, and a place like LaGuardia. It's gonna be a different goal. But if we can work together towards that goal and really take seriously that obligation to provide the next generation of children, our children, the opportunity that, that they will need in order to do what my grandfather did, which was build a business that sent two generations of his offspring to college. And, and that, that opportunity that he had to do it with a high school diploma is not there anymore. So how do we make sure that all our children have the opportunity that my grandfather had to create a business, a livelihood, become an employer that not only helped us, but other people as well? That opportunity doesn't exist without college or higher ed. It means in higher ed, we need to embrace innovation. We need to stop resisting online, stop resisting alternatives to bricks and mortar, stop insisting that everybody go between the ages of 18 and 22, and embrace the, the differentiation that is taking place in the sector that will make possible the dream of equal educational opportunity for everyone. And, and I thank you for inviting us to share in that effort with you. Please, please give our... These are extraordinary leaders. My dream is to clone all of them. We can clone them, we could all retire. But please again, give them another round of applause. Thanks so much for being a fantastic.